In today's real estate exam prep video, we're gonna continue our series on key important real estate vocabulary terms. We're gonna do 101 through 110 of 300 today. So let's get rolling. Hey everyone, my name is Paul Vicheski and welcome to the Real Estate Classroom YouTube channel where our mission is simple to help you pass your real estate exam the first time. Key real estate vocabulary words, man, they're so important to you doing that. So let's pick up where we left off from our last video. Let's do 101 of 300, which is a lease contract, a lease, a lease contract or lease agreement. Now, a lease agreement is a legal contract between the landlord and the tenant. Now, remember, it's so important, you guys, remember the legal names for parties to a contract. When there's a lease contract involved, the lessor is the landlord and the lessee is the tenant, okay? Now, the, the rental agreement or the lease, the lease agreement, it conveys what's called the legal right of possession or referred to as usage and control rights to the tenant for a certain period of time. Now, if you own a piece of property, let's say I own a piece of property. I have the I, own, I have legal title, which means I own it. And because of the bundle of rights, I have the right to lease it out to you. So once we sign the lease contract, then I transfer or convey the legal right of possession to you which means now you have the right to possess it, to occupy the property. You have the right to enjoy the property and you control the usage of that property as long as that usage conforms with uh, local and state and federal laws and the terms of our lease contract, the, the terms and conditions that are outlined in our lease contract now. And it's for a specific period of time, all right? so. Remember, a lease agreement is a bilateral contract, which means that once it's agreed to by the landlord and the tenant, then the terms of that contract are enforceable by both parties. And then the last thing you have to know about a lease, a contract or a lease agreement is under the statute of frauds. It, uh, the statute of fraud says all real estate contracts to be enforceable must be in writing with one exception, and that is a residential lease contract of one year or less. It can be verbal and still be enforceable, but if it's more than one year, even if it's residential, it must be in writing to be enforceable. 102, what is a leasehold interest? Well, you know, everybody has a legal interest in a property when a real estate contract is, um, is signed. So for example, a buyer signs a purchase contract to purchase a home, they have equitable interest or sometimes called equitable title. So when a lease contract is signed, the tenant and the landlord, they have legal interest in the property because remember, the tenant has the legal right of possession and usage, but the landlord also still has the legal title. So we have to call those legal interests something. So in this case, when a lease contract is signed, the lessee, which is the tenant, their legal interest is called a leasehold interest. And the landlord's or the lessor's interest is called a lease fee interest. So you have to remember those two terms. Just remember, everything ends up having, everything and everyone ends up having a legal name. The lessee, I'm sorry, the tenant, their legal name is the lessee. The landlord or property manager, their legal name is the lessor. What interest or estate do they have in that property? The lessee has a leasehold interest and the lessor has a leased fee interest. Everything has a legal name. All right, so for the next four key terms, we're going to talk about different types of tenancies or estates. And the basic, I guess the best way to explain it is we have a lease contract and that lease contract is going to determine, specifically determine how long that tenant can stay there. Is it month to month? Is it a six month lease? Is it a one year lease? Those type of things. That tenancy refers to the amount of time that tenant can stay there in accordance with that, that lease agreement, all right? 
tenancy, that's what it means, or estate. Tenancy or estate mean the same thing in this context. The first one I want to talk about is tenancy for years or commonly referred to as an estate for years. With a tenancy for years, the lease agreement has a specified termination date or a specified expiration date. So I'll give you an example. Uh, a one-year residential lease. It expires on May 31st of 2021. That has a definite expiration date. The key with tenancy for years is the lease agreement has a fixed expiration date. Now, the most common in residential is a one-year lease, but it doesn't have to be for one year. It could be for three months or six months or two years. The key to remember under tenancy for years is that tenant is allowed to stay under that lease agreement until this expiration date, a fixed expiration date. That's the key under tenancy for years. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about for tenancy for years is for the purposes of taking your real estate exam. Tenancy for years, there is no notice to terminate that's required. Now, in real life, in many states, there still has to be a notice that's given. So for example, I'm in Nebraska. So even if the, the landlord and tenant were to sign a one-year lease agreement for an apartment under state law, if the tenant wants to move, they have to give the landlord a 30-day notice uh, to move out. If I don't want, as a landlord, if I don't want to renew the lease with a tenant, I have to give the, that tenant a 30-day notice uh, that giving them notice that I'm not going to renew the lease. Um, and that notice has to be given 30 days prior to the expiration of the lease contract. Now, for the purposes of the test, you have to know that under tenancy for years, there's a fixed expiration date included in that lease, in that lease contract. So therefore, no notice by either party is required. Now, let's go to number 104. Periodic tenancy are commonly referred to as a state from period to period. Probably the best example I can give you is a month-to-month -month lease agreement. So within the within the, the lease agreement itself, the landlord and, and the tenant are agree, agreeing that this is a month-to-month. -month. So what that means is tenancy continues automatically each month. Um, until the tenant or the landlord give notice to the other that uh, that tenancy is going to end. So a tenant can live in an apartment on a month to month agreement for years. It just means each month the period renews. But at some point when the tenant wants to leave or the landlord wants the tenant to move out, a 30 day notice typically is given. The point is notice is given under a periodic tenancy to terminate that tenancy. Number 105, tenancy at will. This is where there's a landlord and tenant, but they have not established a duration. There's no fixed expiration date and there's no period to period like a month to month. Either party can terminate this tenancy at any time and the termination is immediate. Now, a common example of a tenancy at will is when someone rents out there or lets somebody stay in a spare bedroom. So let's say Tim, has a friend, Sam, and, friend, and Sam needs a place to stay for a while. There, it's undetermined the amount of time. There's no fixed expiration and there's no month-to-month -month period or month-to-month -month, uh, agreement here. It's just, Tim says, I'll let you stay in my, in my spare bedroom for a while. It's undetermined. Sam is the tenant at will. So under tenancy at will, it allows Tim to tell Sam to get out at any time and it allows Sam to tell Tim I'm moving out at any time. So notice is given, but the notice is immediate, right? So Tim says, hey, Sam, I want you to leave and I want you to leave now. Sam has to pack up his stuff and move out and vice versa. That is tenancy at will. Remember, it's immediate. Immediate notice to vacate is all that's required. All right, number 106, what is tenancy at sufferance? Well, let's keep it simple here. The term sufferance is the key term here. It is created when the tenant wrongfully uh, holds over or stays past the expiration date that's been agreed to in the lease, whether that's a fixed expiration lease where 
there's a definitive date in which the, the lease agreement expires or it's month to month. And a notice has been given to, to move by the landlord and the tenant doesn't move. That's a situation, a legal situation, where it's called tenancy at sufferance. And typically what ends up happening is the landlord has to go into court and evict the tenant. Number 107, what's an actual eviction? Well, this is where the tenant needs to be removed legally from the premises. It's a legal process in which the tenant is legally removed from the premises for a a, num a number of reasons. Maybe they didn't pay their rent or there was a breach in the term of a lease contract and they just, they were supposed to do it according, do whatever, mow the lawn, whatever, according to the lease contract and they're not doing it. So the landlord evicts them for breach contract. It may be that the tenant is violating some law or ordinance. Maybe they're dealing drugs or maybe they have a, a, they're operating a business out of that dwelling and they're not supposed to be, or they're violating the zoning law. Those are all grounds for actual eviction. Actual eviction means that the landlord evicts the tenant from uh, the property. Now, constructive eviction number 108 is where the conduct of the landlord rises to the level where the tenant has to move out, and therefore that's called constructive eviction. This is where the tenant is, for the most part, evicting the landlord. So under constructive eviction, the conduct of the landlord impairs the tenant's ability to enjoy the premises as is their right. All right. Essentially, the tenant is forced to move out and they terminate the lease. And when that happens, they do so without liability, meaning they don't owe the landlord any more rent. Now, let me give you some examples of where we're going to see constructive eviction. Number one is the landlord willfully cuts off electricity or heating to the, um, to the premises. We call those essential services. So the landlord cuts off essential services to the tenant. That would be an example where the tenant could move out and not be responsible for paying any rent. Uh, the landlord makes extensive alterations to the premises. So the tenant is in there and then all of a sudden the landlord says, hey, I'm going to start remodeling the place. Uh, number three, the landlord attempts to lease the property to another tenant or the landlord in the case of an apartment community where there's multiple levels and there's an elevator. Uh, the, the, the elevator stops working and the landlord refuses to repair that. That's an example or examples of where constructive eviction would come into play here. The tenant must actually vacate the premises or move out because if the tenant doesn't move out, they still have to pay the rent. They're still liable for paying the rent. Constructive eviction happens when the tenant moves out because of one of those examples that I just gave you. And so therefore, from that point forward, they have terminated the lease agreement and they're no longer liable to pay, pay the rent. Now, there's a lot of what ifs in real life to constructive eviction, but this is what you need to know for your real estate exam. Number 109, what is subleasing or commonly referred to as subletting? Now, number one, understand that all lease contracts allow the tenant to sublease or sublet unless there's language in the contract that specifically prohibits it. And most of the time there, there, there is such language. But if there's no language in the, in the lease contract that prohibits subleasing, guess what? The tenant can sublease, sublease the dwelling. So here's what happens. I have an example on your screen what subleasing would look like. We have the landlord that rents out the, the dwelling to the tenant for 500 bucks a month. The tenant then subleases the property to a subtenant for $600 a month. Now the tenant, they may move out or they may not move out. They may stay there and just allow the tenant to move into a spare bedroom. Either way, that's considered subleasing. So the tenant or the subtenant pays the tenant $600 a month, and then the tenant pays the landlord $500 a month, and the tenant 
profits $100. I, I really think college students probably invented subleasing because it's very common in college communities, to be honest with you. So um, here's what happens. If the tenant fails to pay the landlord 500 bucks for monthly rent and the landlord must evict the tenant, the landlord is also going to have to evict the subtenant, even if the subtenant has paid up, or is paid up on their, their $600 monthly rent. However, if the subtenant fails to pay the rent, the tenant, not the landlord, the original tenant is the one that's going to have to evict them out of the dwelling. All right. The landlord in this case would have really no, uh, no standing whatsoever in the eviction suit. Kind of an interesting little um, subleasing I find fascinating for a lot of different reasons, but that's what you have to know for your real estate exam. Now, number 110, the last one we're gonna talk about is security deposits. What is a security deposit? Well, a security deposit is a specific amount of money that is collected. Notice I didn't say paid, it's collected from the tenant by the landlord or the property manager. And the reason I use the term collected is when the landlord or the property manager collects that security deposit, that money is not theirs. It's the tenants. It's still theirs until some future date when the landlord or the property manager can legally deduct all or some of uh, an amount from the security deposit. But up until that point, it is still the tenant's money. So the landlord collects it from the tenant. And why do they collect that? Well, it's money that's there in case, number one, the tenant owes any money, any back rent or fees or something to that uh, extent from the tenant when tenancy ends. So let's say that the tenant moves out and the tenant still owes one month's rent and 50 bucks in late fees. Well, it allows the the landlord to deduct that amount from the security deposit. It also is there in case, the, you know, maybe the tenant did some damage to the property beyond normal wear and tear. That money can be used to fix that damage. So that's what secure, that's what a security deposit is. If you're going to continue studying, check out this video right here. If you have not subscribed, click the little circle to my left. Comments and questions down below in the comments section. Love those. See you all in the next video.